Welcome, everyone. I'm Karen Lawrence, president of Sarah Lawrence, and I want to welcome everyone. Welcome Dr. Pedro Nogueira and attendees. We have educators, students, faculty, staff, families, trustees, and other friends. We're very glad that you could be here. I want to say a special thanks to the CDI's professional advisory board member and friend, LaRuth Gray, for connecting us to Dr. Nogueira and making this evening possible. The Child Development Institute annual Longfellow lecture honors the memory of Cynthia Longfellow, who graduated from Sarah Lawrence in 72, and devoted her life to improving the lives of young children. I have the privilege at, at the annual lecture of acknowledging that this event would not be possible without the support of Cynthia's family and friends. As many of you know, CDI's mission is an extension of Sarah Lawrence College's progressive educational pedagogy. It's founded on the perspective of the child as an individual in a social context, and education as broadly conceived as an opportunity for nurturing humanistic social values, emotional, imaginative, and intellectual development. Unfortunately, this type of holistic education uh, is getting scarcer and scarcer and currently exists primarily in pockets, certain communities, certain schools, and particularly and most often in classrooms by teachers who are finding ways to keep children and their needs at the center of education. In many educational settings ranging from early childhood through college, students' academic capabilities and performances are by and large viewed as either separate from their interests and cultural backgrounds, as well as larger structural inequalities, or they're used to label students in a narrow way. As Dr. Nagara has said, more often than not, we discuss disparities in student performance in isolation from the other factors that contribute to them, such as inequity in per-pupil spending, unequal access to resources such as science labs and computers, and tremendous differences in the amount of time spent on learning between middle class and low income children. If instead of posing the problem as an achievement gap, which reinforces the idea that individual effort is the key factor determining differences in outcomes, we acknowledge it as an opportunity gap we might do much more to address the disparities that limit the ability of children to learn, but access to opportunity is anything but equal." Unquote. How do we change this course? The first step is reflection, acknowledgement, and understanding. Quote, changing a paradigm is not simply about changing direction, it's about completely changing the way you understand what it is you are doing. Unquote. These words from Dr. Nagara echo loudly as our community currently works towards inclusion and equality in the truest sense of the word, while also understanding the college's collective responsibility and role in being a significant voice and resource to bring forward equal access to educational opportunity. We're honored to have Dr. Pedro Nogueira here this evening to help us reflect and look at these critical issues more deeply and explore more critically how we can use our individual and collective agency to bring about meaningful change in education. I'm pleased to introduce Indira Blackwood to introduce uh, Dr. Nogueira, but I first wanna just thank Indira uh, most of you may know that Indira is leaving Sarah Lawrence. After four glorious years, I thought about chaining, chaining her to that seat so that we don't let her go. She has been a wonderful director of CDI. That uh, Her family has opportunities that uh, necessitate her moving. And I just want to say that we've loved having you here and you've 
done so much to develop, expand, uh, do everything with our programs, both in the community and at the college. So thank you very much. Thank you, President Lawrence. It is wonderful to see you all here today. It is a tremendous honor to introduce Dr. Pedro Nogueira, one of the country's foremost leaders in education. Dr. Nogueira contributes to the field in countless and profound ways as an educator, scholar, and activist. His work primarily focuses on the ways in which schools are influenced by social and economic conditions and the factors that obstruct and promote student achievement. As some of us had the privilege to experience uh, earlier today, Dr. Nogueira is an extraordinary educator. He was a classroom teacher in public schools in Providence, Rhode Island, in Oakland, California, and has held tenured faculty appointments at the Harvard Graduate School of Education at the universe, and at the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Nogueira is currently the Peter L. Agnew Professor of Education at New York University. A prominent researcher and prolific writer, Dr. Nogueira is the executive director of the Metropolitan Center for Research on Equity and the Transformation of Schools. He has published numerous research articles, monographs, and research reports on topics such as urban school reform, conditions that promote student achievement, youth violence, the role of education in community development in national and international contexts, and race and ethnic relations in American society. He is the author of several books, including his very recent book with Alan Blankstein, Excellence Through Equity, Five Principles of Courageous Leadership to Guide Achievement for Every Student. In addition to being an educator and scholar, Dr. Nagar is a well-spoken and passionate activist and advocate for children's rights to high quality education and essential societal supports, such as access to healthcare, safe housing and neighborhoods, and nutritious meals. He appears as a regular commentator on educational issues on CNN, MSNBC, NPR, and other national news outlets. In 2008, he was appointed by the governor of New York to serve on the State University of New York Board of Trustees. And in 2014, he was elected to the National Academy of Education. Dr. Nagara has also served as a member of the US Public Health Service Centers for, Centers for Disease Control Task Force on Youth Violence, been the chair of the Committee on Ethics in Research and Human Rights for the American Educational Research Association, and served on numerous advisory boards to local and national education and youth organizations. Dr. Nagara is a recipient of many distinguished awards and honors, including the Whitney Young Award for Leadership in Education, the Schott Foundation Award for Research on Race and Gender, Scholastic Corporation Education Hero Award, Border Crosser Award for Leadership in Promoting Racial Understanding and Justice, and McSilver Award for Combating Poverty. One only has to look at the depth and breadth of his experiences and the awards he has received to understand his holistic view of children <coughs> and his courageous multifaceted leadership in bringing forth shifts in education. One only has to speak with him to be inspired and have hope that excellence through equity is possible for our children. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Pedro Nogueira. Good evening. It's really a pleasure to be here. I want to thank President Lawrence, uh, for extending the invitation and thanking Dara Blackwood for being such a gracious host for my visit. I've enjoyed already meeting with students and faculty today uh, at Sarah Lawrence and had good conversations. And thank all of you for coming out this evening. I know it's not easy to come out to a lecture at the end of a day, <laughs> uh, especially if you've been working. So I, I, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, my first time visiting Sarah Lawrence, uh, I, had, I thought it was farther away. <laughs> I didn't even get a chance to take a nap on the ride where we were already here. <laughs> Who knew it was in the Bronx? I didn't know that. <laughs> I said, don't say it's in the Bronx. <laughs> but glad to be here and uh, glad to, um, to be with you to talk about the issues facing our country with respect to education. Uh, and I framed these remarks today around inequality and democracy, the 
future of our democracy. Because I believe, and I think probably many of you do, that the future of this country is going to be determined by what happens in the schools. It's that profound. It's that important. And we have all good reason to be concerned. Because what's happening in our schools today, and I think New York State epitomizes in many ways what's wrong, is that many kids are not getting the kind of education they need and deserve to be prepared for life in the 21st century. We have taken a course that's so far off <laughs> of what we should be doing uh, that it is uh, deeply disturbing. And uh, it's one of the reasons why <clears throat> I speak about it, I write about it. I was on MSNBC this past Sunday uh, talking about the Atlanta cheating scandal, trying to redirect the attention away from the cheating scandal to the forces at work that make people cheat. <laughs> Um, the high-pressured environment that educators are working in. I said, if you're going to hold them culpable, there are a whole lot of others who should join them. Yeah. Right? And most of them hold public office. And so the fact of the matter is that at this time, uh, if we're not concerned about our education, we're not paying attention. Uh, and fortunately, many people are. And that's one of the reasons why education continues to be in the news. Even while we're fighting wars and dealing with global warming and any number of other issues, including a, an election coming up, education stays near the top of the priorities because the public knows it's important. And a growing segment of the public also knows something is fundamentally wrong with what we're doing. It should not be that when you ask kids how was school, the first and most often response you hear back is boring. But too often that's what we hear that they're not excited about being in school, that they are rather doing it because either they're trying to pursue their goal of going to college or because someone made them do it. <laughs> and uh, unless we figure out how to make school a better place for learning, <clears throat> I think we're gonna continue down a path where more and more people in this country um, not only are not prepared to participate in democracy, because I think Jefferson was right, you need an educated citizenry for this to work, but also less and less able to, to take on the challenges that face not only this country, but the world. Education's always got to do two things. It's got to impart the skills and knowledge that you need to participate fully in society, not just to be employed, but to vote, serve on a jury, read a paper and understand what you've read. But it's also got to impart the critical thinking, the creativity, the problem-solving ability, so that the next generation can solve the problems that this generation created and hand it off to them. And we set, we're setting up with a lot, aren't we? Right? They're going to have to figure out how to take care of all these old people that are getting older and older. Right? They're going to have to figure out how to deal with an economy that's teetering, and growing inequality, a point I'm gonna come back to in a moment, they're gonna to to figure out global warming. We've just given them a whole lot. And what we've gotta recognize is the knowledge we have to this point is inadequate. Otherwise, we'd have solved the problems. Yeah. So they've gotta have an ability to think outside the box. They've gotta have an ability to imagine new possibilities. <clears throat> I remain optimistic, not naively optimistic, I describe myself as pr a pragmatic optimist, <laughs> but I'm optimistic nonetheless because I spent a lot of time in schools and with children and with educators. And I do know that there are lots of people out there who do get it, that education's gotta be about more than simply preparing kids for a test. But we've got a lot of work to do. So with that in mind, I wanna first start out by laying out the problem. Right? And the problem is, as it has always been, that we expect education to do a lot. Historically, we expected it to figure out how to absorb generations of immigrants, whether they came from Europe or Asia or Africa or Latin America. We have been calling upon our schools, first and foremost, to teach them to become citizens, to teach them English, and usually not giving them a whole lot of resources and support in how to do this and more often than not, expecting the schools to 
not just impart the skills, but to take the culture. Because the price of mobility in America has almost always been assimilation. And previous generations have done it. That's what it takes to become an American, or at least the way we've envisioned it in the past. And it's a point I'll come back to in a moment, but today now, we continue to serve new generations of immigrants. In regards of how many laws we pass to make it more and more difficult, our schools still are required by law to serve all children, including the undocumented. And so they're trying to figure it out. And again, often without the knowledge and skills to do so. We also look to our schools to figure out how to address apartheid in America. And as this picture so aptly reminds us, it took force. Right? <clears throat> President Eisenhower had to send troops to Little Rock to open up Central High School, to allow nine students to go to school and do something that we now take for granted. And what we should know about this journey towards a more inclusive system of education is it also mirrors the journey of American democracy. Because each time we have opened the doors to expand opportunity in education, we have set precedent for expanding the rights of those we allowed in. So it was Brown decision that basically dismantled or let set the precedent for dismantled racial barriers elsewhere. And the same thing happened with <clears throat> for women with, with Title VII, the same thing happened with language rights, the same thing happened with <clears throat> the rights of the disabled. We look to education first to open doors. Is it Title VII or Title IX? I think. <laughs> I'm sorry. Look to education first to open doors before establishing the precedent to, in other sectors of society. And while the process has been uneven, for sure, and a lot of people don't realize the South was the last region of the country to get public education. It took reconstruction to bring public education to the South, and not just for black children, but for white children too. Nonetheless, our schools today are far more accessible, far more open than any other institution in this country. No other institution is required to serve everyone, except our schools. Except there is no mandate for equality or for equity. And right now, we're in a period where poverty is growing. One out of five children in the country today are poor, and in some states, it's higher than that. One out of four in places like California and Michigan. Increasingly, what we know is that as child poverty rates grow across the country, this becomes an educational issue. It becomes an educational issue because hungry children don't do so well in school. And in this country, we are literally sending kids to school hungry. I was talking to a group of principals in Michigan one of whom described sending kids home with food on Fridays because they knew that many of them would not eat over the weekend. In New York City, there are schools that open up in the summer, not for summer school, but to feed kids in the summer that they know won't eat on a regular basis. It's amazing, in a country as rich as ours, that even access to food and nutrition is not something that we can say is guaranteed to everyone. Education is. But all the other things you know we, that, that we need, like health and clean water, and good food, not guaranteed. It's ironic, right? Because we have a law called No Child Left Behind. But we're still leaving so many behind. And that slogan, that name came from not the Bush administration, but Marion Wright Edelman and the Children's Defense Fund. And when she coined the term or the slogan, Leave No Child Behind, it didn't mean Let's test the kids as frequently as possible. <laughs> she had something else in mind, and it did have to do with child welfare and well-being. And so we have drifted away, and be, consequently, what do we know? We know that the schools that serve the kids with the greatest needs, the schools that are serving the kids in poverty, are almost always the schools that are failing. Surprise, surprise. It's true throughout New York State, it's true throughout the country. We also know by now that simply telling the school they're failing and affixing a letter grade on the school 
does not help the school to improve. You know, it's ironic now because it's become common in many states to put letter grades on schools, as if somehow that's going to help. I would think that if they put an F on the school, the state should be sued if they allow children to go there. But they've already said it's a failing school. I was in Miami visiting Edison High School, which was a triple F school when I visited. And I asked the principal, I think it be triple F. He said, we well, simply failed the state exam three years in a row. I said, what happens if we fail again? He said, we will fail again. Because 85% of our kids don't speak English. Wow. Haven't been in the country long enough to pass an exam in English. So we will fail again. I said, well, what happens next? He said, well, the state is threatening to take over our school. I said, are you worried? He said, not at all. I said, why not? He said, well, first of all, I'm going to quit at the end of this year. <laughs> and the thing you should know is everyone described him as committed, dedicated, hardworking, but he was tired. Tired of being beaten down. He said, the crazy thing is the state can't take us over because there's too many schools just like us, with quadruple F and five Fs. He says, what's more, do you think the state of Florida would know what to do if they took us over? Is there some secret formula that they've been holding back on that they will now make available to the children at Edison High School? That's the farce, isn't it? Governor Cuomo right now is threatening to take over schools in New York City that are failing. If he actually knew what to do, then Roosevelt should be the model, shouldn't he? Because the state of New York's controlled Roosevelt public schools for 13 years. Governor Christie controls Newark, Patterson, and Camden. And when's the last time you ever heard him talk about what he's going to do to fix those schools? We have a very, very strange system of accountability, don't we? That those in charge have no responsibility or accountability at all. And those with the least power do. So <clears throat> poverty is not something that we can avoid, but we certainly can't continue to expect that schools can solve this by themselves, which is in effect what we've done. Schools and educators are on the front lines figuring out how do I address the needs of these kids? How do I raise test scores when I know some of these kids are hungry or don't have a stable home to live in or live in cars? The fastest growing population of kids in the country right now, 1.3 million homeless children. 1.3 million homeless, and all of them go to school. And it's clear, again, that the schools serving the children's greatest needs are the schools that are struggling. They, don't, they struggle not because the kids can't learn, they struggle because we're not addressing the needs. And that's what we've got to stay focused on, is what do we do about that? And what do we do about the fact that we now live in a country which amongst advanced, developed countries is the most unequal in the world? That's our country. It's always helpful to have a Nobel Prize winner to back you up. So Joseph Stiglitz at Columbia says, the United States has become the most unequal country amongst advanced industrial nations. We have less opportunity not, <clears throat> than not only all of Europe, but any of the advanced industrial countries for which there is data. And what that means is very simple. The life chances of an individual are more dependent on the income and education of his parent than in any other country. And an implication of that is people born in the bottom who unfortunately choose the parents who are poor and not well educated, he says sarcastically, we don't choose our parents, will be more likely not to be able to live up to his potential. What does that mean? We are reproducing inequality across generations. We were once seen as the place where each generation could hope that their prospects would get better. I want to encourage you to read a new book by, um, I'll think of his name in a second, Robert Putnam at Harvard, political scientist, wrote a book called Our Kids. Describes going back to the town he grew up in, Clinton, Ohio, a town, a working class town that once sent 80% of its kids off to college when he grew up. He goes back now and he finds a town that mirrors America, totally divided. The wealthy live on one side with homes facing the Lake Erie, the other side, the poor, devastated. What happened? What happened is the American dream that once made it possible for people like Putnam to get to become a distinguished professor at Harvard has vanished for the kids on the other side of the tracks. And as that continues, those paths continue, our future becomes more and more imperiled. We pretend that we are focused on addressing the achievement gap, 
If you listen to the rhetoric that comes out of the Obama administration, the Bush administration before it, and just about every governor, they say that's what we're doing. We're focused on the achievement gap. Well, the gap's growing. Gap's growing because, in fact, it's 40% larger today than it was 30 years ago. How could that be? Well, because today we expect schools to solve problems that are not educational. And we don't do things that other countries that outperform us, that we claim to want to compete with, are doing. And every time they release the latest international scores on the PISA or the OECD results, the United States is falling further and further behind, not just in math and science and reading, but in who's, how many, what percentage of people going to college. We should be number one in the world. We're way behind South Korea, which wasn't even on the list before. South Korea. Well, what do these countries do that we don't do? Well, for one thing, they have universal preschool. I was, I was explaining this to the National Governors Association. I was invited to speak to all the nation's governors. And I said that there was only one state where over 80% of the children are in preschool. And most of them were surprised to find out that it's Oklahoma. So you wouldn't expect that in Oklahoma. And the governor of Oklahoma is right there. And I said, why don't you explain why Oklahoma is the leader in preschool? He said, well, we've seen the research. And the education that starts in infancy benefits the child throughout their life. I said, well, maybe you better share that research with your colleagues in the room because that's not just true in Oklahoma. That's true throughout the country. We have ignored the basics, and consequently, we're seeing those who have the least and come from homes that have the least, do the least well. That's what happens. If you look at the educational testing service, they've been following this for a long time, and these patterns, what do they find? Family income is the strongest predictor for how well a student will do in school. And when you combine family income with how much education the parents have, particularly the mother, because the mother is usually the first teacher, you can predict with great consistency how well a child will do in school. Not in every case, but in the aggregate. And right now, look at the wealth gap, black-white wealth gap. As great today as in South Africa, under apartheid in 1970. And we wonder why there's a Ferguson? It's amazing. Because when you look, <laughs> when you look at the list of the 10 poorest cities in the country, Ferguson's not even on the list. It's not even one of the poorest. The other thing that's interesting when you look at the list, they're not all black. Only three of the poorest cities in the country are black, three of them are white, four of them are Latino. Poverty is multiracial, although it's depicted in the media as having only one color, which I think adds to the sense that maybe it's not that big a problem. Inequality shows up in lots of other ways, in wealth, in health, like life expectancy, infant mortality, in the criminal justice system, in incarceration rates and arrests, and of course in education. And that's the point. Edu it follows a pattern. The achievement gap that we claim to be so concerned about, what is it? It's nothing more than an educational manifestation of social inequality. That's what it is. And if we think we can address the achievement gap by only focusing on achievement, by only focusing on schools, then we're fooling ourselves. We're fooling ourselves because as income gaps grow, and as we ignore the fact that Latinos, the fastest growing segment of the U.S. population, is lags furthest behind. There's a report today. Right now, in New York City, Latinos have the highest dropout rates of any group. Any group. In New York City and in many parts of the country, we have a phenomenon they call long-term L's. English language learners. They're long-term because they never learn English in school. Why? Because they're taught by teachers who are never trained to meet their needs. And so they stay in school year after year, and they grab, or they leave semi-literate in two languages. Because they lost their first language and they still don't know English. Wow, now they're really disabled, aren't they? Not a very effective way to prepare another generation of children. 
And what we know is these inequities that show up in education show up in many different ways. And now more and more people are aware, wow, those discipline gaps, like in the suspension rates, actually are driving the achievement gaps. Because kids who aren't in school aren't learning. And often they're unsupervised. So it's also driving delinquency. So you talk about a school to prison pipeline, mm -hmm. metaphor we hear a lot about. I was visiting a school in Oakland, California, visiting with the principal, and he's showing me around the school at all the new facilities, the new computer lab, the new library. We get to his office, and there's a little boy about this tall waiting for him. He turns to me before he gets there, he says, you see that boy? He said, there's a prison cell in San Quentin waiting for him right now. I said, how do you know that? He said, well, I can tell by the way he behaves. He's, a, he's always a problem. His father's in prison. His brother's in prison. That's where he's going to end up. And then I asked, well, given what you know about this boy, what are you doing to keep him out of prison? And he turns to look at me surprised because he doesn't think that's his job. In fact, what he's about to do was to suspend him long term for a month and send the work home to his sick grandmother and effectively wash his hands. What you should know is that principal was African American too. It would be a mistake to think this is just about race. It's about more than that. It's about the way institutions have come to operate and have come to treat certain children as expendable. And unless we can address that, we're not going to get any closer to addressing these disparities in graduation rates and the disparities that continue to lead to such unequal opportunities and unequal patterns in our country. We should all be concerned that there are cities and neighborhoods that we know now are no zones, like don't go there. For a while, when you got off the, 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 the got to rent a, rent a car in Miami, in the um, rental car place, they would put a red line around, don't get off at these exits. Too dangerous. Don't go to Liberty City. Don't go to Little Haiti. Don't go to, don't go. Dangerous. Well, guess what? There are children who live in those neighborhoods. They don't have an option but to go. And so simply cordoning off certain areas is not going to help us because those areas are growing. We had a new study by Brookings out quote, about slum burbs. Increasingly, the slums are not in the cities, they're out in the suburbs. Ferguson is a suburb. And there are lots of companies like it. But right now, the highest poverty rates in the country are what they call the Inland Empire, in, right outside of Los Angeles. It's not central Los Angeles, it's outside of Los Angeles. Because the cities are gentrifying. And as they do, poor people are being pushed out with fewer and fewer services. So the achievement gap is about addressing gaps and opportunities, about addressing the fact that we are one of few nations in the world that consistently spends more money to educate the wealthy than we do the poor. Canadians don't do that. They don't, I was in, in Holland. They certainly don't do that. You go into a poor community, a school serving immigrant kids, it has the same facilities as schools in affluent areas. This is a part of American exceptionalism. And we're going to hear a lot about that in this campaign, American exceptionalism. Maybe we shouldn't be so exceptional in this area. Maybe we should follow what some other countries are doing, particularly if we're really concerned about where we're going. So these gaps in opportunity are really at the crux, at the crux of what we've been calling the achievement gap. Problem is that we have policymakers like the former chancellor, Joel Klein, in New York City, who believe poverty is not the issue. Here we have a editorial that he wrote, but look at who his co-authors were. Janet Morgia from the National Council de la Raza, Michael Lomax from the United Negro College Trust. So he got some good folks to be with him. Look what they say. They said, in the debate over how to fix American public education, many believe that schools alone cannot overcome the impact that economic disadvantage has on a child, that life outcomes are fixed by poverty and family circumstances, and that education doesn't work until other problems are solved. This theory is, in some ways, comforting for educators. Wow, what sick educators would be comforted by that? Problem is, the theory is wrong. It's hard to know how wrong because we haven't yet tried to make the changes that would tell us. But plenty of evidence demonstrates 
that schools can make an enormous difference despite the challenges presented by poverty and family background. Look what's happened. You know, not that long ago, the pendulum was just swung in a different direction. We used to say, well, the reason why certain kids don't perform is because they're genetically inferior. Or they're culturally deprived. Now it's swung in another direction. Now we say, nope, nope, the problem is they're teachers. If we can just get rid of the teachers, that was Michelle Ree's mantra, right? Fire bad teachers! And she appears on Newsweek with a broom. And went to about trying to do it in Washington, D.C. And so, I would say that is part of the problem. Not because poverty is a learning disability. There's absolutely no evidence that poor kids can't learn. In fact, I will show evidence that under the right conditions, poor kids can thrive, they can succeed. But poverty ignored. And when I say poverty, I don't just mean not having much money, but I mean trauma. I mean not having housing. I mean not having family support. I mean all the social issues that accompany poverty. When you ignore those issues, then the kids with the greatest needs will always be the kids furthest behind. So the question that I've been focused on, the question I think we all need to focus on is how do we mitigate the effects of poverty? Now, I would like to say, how do we relaunch a war on poverty, but I don't think we're there yet. I don't hear either any of the candidates talk about a new war on poverty, Democrat or Republican, which is ironic because the last president in this country to call for full employment was who? Richard Nixon. Wow. Republican. He was just following up on Johnson because guess what? Everybody thought that made sense. Get people back to work. Address the basic needs. Those ideas have gone in the past. So mitigating poverty is, I think, worthwhile and important. It's also important that we ask, what kind of education is needed for schools to play a role in breaking the cycle of poverty? That is, is the education they're getting now going to do the trick? I think not. So one of the things we know, and they know it for sure in Port Chester, I know they got a couple of teachers here today, because they've been doing it for a long time is that community schools work. What's a community school? It's a school that works to provide other services. I remember when I talked to one of your principals, she explained to me what led them to develop a community school in Port Chester at Edison Elementary. So one day they went on a field trip, and the teacher opened up a, a five-year-old's lunchbox and saw a bottle of Ambersol in it. And she asked, Nino, ¿qué pasó? What's, what's going on with this? And he opened his mouth and saw abscess too. And she just looked at it. She knew this child was in pain. Being sent to school dutifully by his parents with painkillers. And she realized then, you know, we got to do more than simply focus on the academics. And fortunately, they worked with the, the congresswoman to get resources in. Children's Aid Society has been doing it through private resources. The most famous example of this is the Harlem Children's Zone. Jeffrey Canada has been doing it 6,000 kids in Central Harlem. Now, Jeffrey Canada can do that because he's raised $400 million in their endowment. He's got a pipeline to Wall Street, and they're all on his board. So it's hard to see how you replicate that. But the fact is that these models of schools actually do work. New York City is about to launch a plan to build Several more, $52 million to build community schools. I get worried, because I think if they try to do it too fast, they might screw things up and waste a lot of money. But the idea is right. If you can bring more social workers, and I met a social worker here this evening, more psychologists, more counselors into school, you make it possible for teachers to focus on teaching, because they don't have to be the social worker and the psychologist. I was, uh, and a meeting, we were talking about how to reduce suspension rates at schools in New York City. And we had principals of the two high schools in the city with the highest suspension rates. Boys and girls, and they went Clinton. And the principal principals of, of boys and girls who's been under the hot seat because the governor's been threatening to shut his school down, he said, I suspend because I lack other tools. So the commissioner said, what do you mean by that? He said, I'll give you an example. Student comes to me, just released from Rikers, wants to enroll in my school. I say, let him in. 
He's showing responsibility. He wants to be in school, so I let him in. I, I register him. That day, he gets into two fights and punches the teacher in the face. And then I find out he's bipolar and not on his medication. He said, why didn't Rikers send me a note, let me know he was coming, and maybe send the meds too? Guess what? New York City controls Rikers and the schools there, and it controls the Department of Education, but there's no conversation. He said, well, we need a social workers and counselors. If you're going to send us your juvenile offenders, then at least send us the resources to address their needs. I would go further. Let's, why don't we start schools in our corrections institutions that actually can start to rehabilitate some of these kids so we don't stop having a revolving door? Two-thirds of the young people we incarcerate will be back in less than two years. And we are spending over $70,000 per student. That, that's probably enough to pay tuition here, isn't it? <laughs> and more. Huh? $70,000 a year to keep a young person in custody. Not an effective use of resources. We have other models. Here's one, East Bay Biotech Academy. This is a, an academy that I actually helped to start 22 years ago. Includes seven high schools, five biotech companies, three community colleges, a four-year school. Young people graduate and walk into jobs paying $15 an hour in biotech. And if they decide to continue that education, they have a career now in a lucrative field. Go to Worcester Tech in, in Worcester, Massachusetts. 24 career academies at their school. You can do the health sciences. You can do learn um, culinary arts. 82% of the kids go to college because it's not career or college, it's career and college. Ask your students how many of them are working now while they're in school. And Worcester Tech, one of two urban high schools in the state that get level one rating by the state. 100% of the African American students have graduated for the last five years. 100%. Why don't we learn from models that work? We've got other promising models that work. Started a central uh, renewable energy project, a central high school in, in Newark. A small business incubator project, the big picture school in Providence, Rhode Island, where kids are developing their businesses while they're in school. Urban Health Medical Sciences Program in the Bronx. Kids graduate with EMT certificates. They can go into jobs paying $40,000 a year. Year Up. I'm on the board of Year Up. It's now in 12 cities. Goal of Year Up is to work with young people just at GED. Provide six months of training in high tech and finance. They're working the jobs making $50,000 a year. You could do that in six months. Imagine what you could do if we were more strategic. This is the reason why we're so critical of My Brother's Keeper, the President's Initiative. What's in it? Nothing. Vague promises. I told them, they asked me for feedback before they launched. I said, why don't you just fund things that work, that we can spread, do more of? I don't know why they didn't listen, but that's not what we're doing. We have 28 schools in New York State, most of them in New York City, that have a waiver from the state to do performance-based assessment. Wow, it's amazing what they do because they graduate kids in higher numbers, those kids are less likely, to, more likely to go to college, less likely to be in remedial courses. My daughter went to one of them, School of the Future in Manhattan. School of the Future, like the others, every student does an exhibition in each grade in a different subject. And when you do the exhibition, it's all done through an iterative process where you revise, resubmit, revise, resubmit with the teacher. Ninth grade, she decides she's going to do her history project on the Roman and the Inca Empire. She's got to figure out why these empires, how they rose, and why they eventually collapsed. She has to have multiple sources. She has to understand the economy, politics, culture, religion. By the end of the year, she has a 25-page research paper as a ninth grader. But doing the paper is not good enough because then she has to stand before teachers and students and explain the paper, explain it, and present it. And then she's judged and evaluated. Only three grades are possible. Distinction, competent, or do-over. Do-over, because they say they're focused on mastery, not simply passing. <laughs> Lots of schools doing these things, showing us that if we focus on engagement rather than achievement, we get kids who are willing learners. Wow. 
kids who are invested as learners who are receptive. Very different way of thinking about learning, isn't it? You know, I say right now, we, we got everybody preoccupied with how to raise test scores, but not focused on how to get kids engaged. Not focused on how to get kids to become self-motivated learners. I'm visiting a school not long ago in Brooklyn, talking to a group of boys, they're reading a passage from Call of the Wild, a novel by Jack London, a book I loved as a kid. So I asked them, what do you think? They said, we like the story. One said, I want to know what happens. I said, what happened? And they said, look, they only got two pages. They said, Tanisha, why are you only getting two pages? She said, well, because that's the way it's going to appear on the test. You only get a passage. How many of you take a passage to the beach in the summer to read? <laughs> Nobody. You want to get the whole plot. Don't you want to know how the story ends? Well, you don't become a lover of reading, reading an excerpt from the book. But if you're focused on test scores, you might think that this is a way to boost them. I can't tell you how to go to schools where instead of really focused on teaching the kids, they're focused on test preparation. Yet another sign they were doing something wrong. Here's a school that's doing something right. Hollenbeck Middle School in East Los Angeles. All the kids, poor, recent immigrants, mostly from Latin America. This is a 90-minute last math class. And look at the kids, up out of their seats, teaching each other, working together. And the teacher is so good, she's in the back talking to me. <laughs> if she wanted to, she could stop and do yoga. Because the kids are in control of learning. That's how good she is. They've been prepared to work together. They've been prepared to teach each other. And because they're in charge of the learning, she can facilitate the learning. She can move amongst the kids. She can differentiate the support. Now, the sad thing is, when I went to that school, I asked my son, who was there as a city year volunteer, I said, are there other teachers like this? He said, there's one. I said, just one? He said, just one. And he's the best. I said, what do you mean he's the best? He said, come on. Takes me there, going to the classroom, the teacher has a drum set in the front of his room. I said, what's he doing with the drum set? He said, let's watch. <laughs> Class starts, he's playing drums, kids are playing drums, he's using music to engage his students. They are excited, they have, he has kids cutting other classes to be in his class. Yeah. <laughs> the sad thing is that this is true in many schools I visit. Who's learning from them? Even right next door, teachers who are struggling don't even know there's a, there's a highly effective teacher next door that got kids excited about learning. That's what we should be focused on. Not threatening teachers with their jobs if they don't raise test scores. Actually showing them what good teaching looks like. And showing them how to get kids to take responsibility for their education. That's what Youth Speak does. Youth Speak figured out a while ago, guess what, the kids like rap music. You know what, you can use rap music to teach poetry. And if you get kids writing poetry, guess what? You can get them to write all kinds of things. Because that's the key, getting them to write. And I've seen workshops larger than this go on for hours with kids, where kids are writing about their lives and sharing their work. And the most amazing thing is the response of their teachers, who are blown away to see their kids engaged and writing kids who they thought were illiterate. It's about shifting the focus, shifting the focus onto engagement, onto cultivating voice, and recognizing that we not only have to engage the students, we've got to engage the parents too. Over 50% of student achievement is influenced by what parents do. Over 50%. And most of the schools I go to, what's your strategy for getting parents involved? They don't really have one. We hope they'll come out for the parent-teacher night. We hope. Well, here's a school in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Talk about poverty. They got poverty that we don't even see in this country. Over 80% of the people unemployed, over 40% of the children at this school, Sapphire Rose Primary School, were orphans. Parents died of AIDS. The principal was seated in the back with the glasses, Bruce Demons. He said when he got to the school, the school was in shambles. Pipes had been stolen, windows broken, teachers not showing up, kids coming, hoping to get fed. So he decides after he's assigned there, he's going to start by holding a party for the community. He calls it a Thanksgiving party. So people come out because he's got food and music. They say, what are you thanking for? He said, I'm thanking you for the help you're going to provide to the school. He said, but we haven't helped you. He said, that's right. I'm thanking you in advance for the help you're going to provide. <laughs> so they get the joke. He said, okay, well, he said, what, what kind of help do you need? He said, first, we've got to stop the vandalism. 
I said, well, we know the guys who've been breaking into the school and stealing. They, they, they're right here. They're called Totsi. Right? He says, okay, let me meet them. And he meets them. He talks to them. He cuts a deal. He says, you guys, you can live here, but you have to provide security for the school. So now the guys who used to rob the school are providing security. No one gets paid. He says, you know what? Kids need to be fed. Talks to a group of mothers. He said, let's start a garden. Look at all the land we have here. So now they have a huge garden. 50% of the food goes to the families, the other 50% to feed the children. They have a clinic on site, staffed by parents, none of whom are trained. But there's a clinic there. I said, what happens if a kid is really sick? He said, most of the time we just give them some water and rub their heads. <laughs> Half of them are, so they're really sick, we have to get a nurse in, but not easy. Parents volunteer to clean the bathrooms. Parents are, every classroom I visited, four and five parents, assisting teachers. Over 80 parents a day. This is the governing body. I kept asking Bruce, I said, how'd you do it? He said, I didn't do it, I work for them. This is their school. I'll be gone eventually. They'll still be here. They've got to own this. He gets it. He's their servant, not the other way around. And so when you look at schools that have figured this out, what you realize is they have a different approach, and this is the approach we've been advocating for. We call it a broader and bolder approach, a change in policy, a more holistic vision. Just before the 2008 election, we took out an ad, put it in the New York Times, Washington Post, got it signed by leading educators, scientists, policymakers across the country. We said, look, at the minimum, when you think about the reauthorization of No Child Left Behind, do three things. Include preschool, yes. expand access to health care, and expand summer and after school because they, right now there is a 6,000 hour learning gap between middle class and poor kids. Well, no sooner have we taken out the ad than another group took out an ad saying, no, stay the course. This one, led, this one written by who? Joel Klein, Reverend Al Sharpton, New English. Odd combination, don't you think? <laughs> and what do they say? No, it's not about poverty. Just focus on standards of accountability. No excuses. So that's what we've been doing. No excuses. Meanwhile, we're seeing more and more kids falling further and further behind. The sad thing is that there is, there are examples out there to show us we could do this differently, and they're getting good results. You want to go to the city in North America that's gotten the best results from poor kids, go to Toronto. Toronto has a different framework. They call it capacity building. They actually look at schools and they say, what does the school need? The school is struggling. They go in and say, what does the school need to improve? The ministries, when the ministry officials come from the Ministry of Ontario, people are happy to see them. Because they say, help us here today. Not like the school districts where the superintendent comes and everybody says, oh, the IRS is here today. <laughs> and Toronto's made more progress in educating poor and immigrant kids than any city in North America. And they did that with a crack smoking mayor. Wow. Wow. Imagine if they had a sober mayor, what they could have done, huh? This is amazing. But for those Canadians, they, they, you know, they, got, they got some things figured out that we don't have figured out. But they got it figured out in Brockton, Massachusetts, too. Brockton, Massachusetts, the largest school in the state of Massachusetts, over 4,000 kids, the second urban high school to get level one rated. Level one rated. How'd they do it? They took a real radical course. They decided to focus on literacy. They said, you know what? These kids can't read. That's what we got to do. We got to make sure that every teacher in the school is a teacher of literacy, regardless of the content. They go to the principal and make the proposal. They say, she says, great idea. I can't make them do it. She, they said, we'll work with the willing. So, okay, but I can't pay them. She said, we'll do it for free. We'll work on our own time. We'll work after school. We'll work on Saturdays. So veteran teachers start training their colleagues. And gradually more and more because they start getting the results. By 2006, 80% of the kids are passing a test. By 2010, over 90% of the kids passing the test, and keep in mind, Massachusetts has the most rigorous standards of any state in the country. For the last four years, over one-third of the senior class has gotten the highest possible score, which qualifies them for the Adams Scholarship. They get to go to any public university, full scholarship. 
And if you could see the picture, you would see one-third African-American, one-third Latino, one-third low-income white. It matches the demographics of the school. You know, I go to some schools, particularly in places like Westchester, where there are these huge disparities, where they're really good at serving privileged kids, not so good at serving high-need kids. I said, you know, the problem here is, I said, suppose I tell you he's a doctor, but he's only good at helping people that are healthy. <laughs> Would you want to go to that doctor? Because basically, that's the kind of school you are. You're only good at helping people that don't need much help. And our measure's got to be, what value do we add for the kids who actually don't have lots of parental support, who don't have access to private tutors? Brockton High is an example of a school that can show you that a child's race and class does not have to predict how well they will do. And that's what we should be hoping for in all of our schools. And here is yet another example from Bethany Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. Sadie Silver featured in that picture. PS 28, we have very fancy names for our schools in New York City. <laughs> but in her school, where over 30% of the kids are homeless, 30%, they're showing that they can still achieve. Now again, she doesn't do this just by putting pressure on the teachers. I go to visit the school, first thing she does is she introduces me to her secretary. She said, this is the person who really runs the school. She does all the administrative work. I said, well then what do you do? She said, I'm the lead teacher. So I didn't become a principal to escape the classroom. I said, come on, let's go visit some classrooms. I go to classrooms, first thing I notice is, like in South Africa, every classroom's got four and five adults. I said, where do you get all these teachers? She said, no, there's only two teachers in there. One's the special ed teacher, the other's the regular teacher. Because almost 30% of the kids are, are, have IEPs. For those of you who know special education, that means they have a, a learning plan. I said, who are the others? They said, they're parents that we train to work in the classrooms. I said, they get paid? She said, no, we have no money to pay them. But they help. They help teachers out. They, they make copies. They do all kinds of things. I see one parent, she's standing right next to a little boy. She said, why is she so close to that boy? I said, well, she's there to keep him calm. And we're glad she's here. <laughs> he has trouble sitting still. She says, come, let me show you the, the professional development I have going on for my teachers today. And I go, and there's a room with eight teachers and two social workers. She has a partnership with Downstate Medical School. And they send in social workers, they also send in optometrists, they send in dentists, the kids get the immunizations there because the school functions as a community center. And the teachers are in a session on how to respond to the social and emotional needs of children. And they're posing questions about the challenges they see with kids. One teacher says, I got a kid who's angry and aggressive, and the other one's got a kid who's depressed. One teacher says, I got a kid who has attachment issues, he's attached to my leg, I can't teach. And in each case, the social workers are giving them, try this, come back tomorrow, let us know how it works. And I'm listening to this discussion. I say, what made you decide to offer this as a form of professional development to your teachers? She said, well, until I did, my teachers were sending too many of our kids to special education. So I realized what I had to do was make our teachers more skilled so they could work with this population of kids, because they are high need. She said, I'm also working with the parents. And so at the school, parents can get their GED because they have a partnership with a job training agency that provides GED training for parents. And they get job training to be a nurse's aide or a security guard because she believes that if the parents are educated and employed, they'll be able to support their children better. Right. It's a holistic vision. She introduced me, she said, let me take you to meet my counselor. She said, but I got to warn you, I got him from the rubber room. I said, the rubber room? Now those of you who know New York know about the rubber room. That's not exactly where you want to recruit your teachers, right, or your counselors. I said, why did you get him in the rubber room? She said, I don't know why he was in the first place. But he had been my guidance counselor when I was in school. And he literally saved my life, so I knew he was good. So I asked for him, they said, you could have him. So I go in there, and this man is talking to a little boy, and I introduce myself to both of them. And I asked the little boy, why are you here today? He said, well, I'm here to learn how to be good. So I said, is it working? He said, yeah, well, I'm tired of being put out of class, so I hope it works, right? And then they explained to me that the school has a zero suspension policy. They're not allowed to suspend kids. They really do focus on helping kids to learn how to behave themselves rather than send them home to watch television. They don't think that's very effective as a form of discipline. So we have these examples. And at this particular school, after my visit, I said, you know, I'm going to write to the chance. I'm going to tell Joel Klein about your school. She said, oh, if you can tell Joel Klein, I'll show you one more thing. She takes me to her office. And her office is set up like a classroom with a big round table. I said, what goes on here? She said, I told you I'm the lead teacher. I'm working with kids that the teachers struggle with. 
He said, but look, she shows me the portfolio of every single student in the school. It's full of their work. And she has a data system monitoring every student because every student at the school has a learning plan. Every student, because nothing's left to chance. It's all very deliberate, very intentional, very focused. So I do write to Klein and I say, look, you need to go visit PS28. Three days later, he shows up and he's also impressed. So he writes about it to every principal in New York City. That's 1,800 principals. Except he only mentions one thing, her data system. Because New York City just spent $100 million in that data system. And he, wanted, he was so happy to see someone using it. So I write back to Joel. I say, Joel, I'm so glad you visited, but you missed it. Because it's not just the data system that makes that school work. And that's the problem, isn't it? That even when the policymakers see success, they don't understand it. They don't understand what it takes to create schools like a PS28 or like a Brockton High School. And consequently, they continue to down the path of policies that are not taking us where we need to be. Fact is that we've got to do this work differently. This is the reason why, no matter whether or not you're an educator, if you're retired, if you're retired, you should be even one of the biggest advocates. Because Social Security isn't barrel. This generation of young people has to be educated and employed to support the next generation of retirees. That's how the system works. When Social Security was started, it was 28 to 1. That was the ratio of workers to retirees. You know what it is right now? 3.1 uh, workers to 1 retirees. Economists say if it gets down to 2.8, the system collapses. So the biggest advocates for educating our kids should be anybody thinking about retirement. And we should be happy. We should really be happy that immigrants still want to come. Because this economy is dependent on immigrant labor. And not just in agriculture. It's in the hotels and restaurants. It's in high tech. It's in, certainly in our hospitals. And they come for the same reasons that the pilgrims came. Come in pursuit of a better life. So we have a lot of work to do. The good news is there are examples out there showing us it can be done with all kinds of kids. You name the kind of kid, I can name a school where they're learning, where they're being successful, where they're thriving. Sad thing is it's not happening nearly enough. Sad thing is that we're not learning from success. So what do we lack most of all? We lack the will. The will to move this country forward to make sure that all kids get the education they need and deserve. Because as I said, our future depends on making that happen. Thank you.